once again, we are indebted to Salem Art Association, also known to some of you as Bush Barn, for um, providing us with some really wonderful speakers over the years. Today will be another one. Um, Kim Fink is a local artist who uh, does printmaking by and large, but he has some interesting ways of doing it that were certainly new to me, and I hope you too will be impressed with what he has to say. As a just a little aside about Bush Barn, Salem Art Association, you are welcome to attend their monthly lectures the first Tuesday of the month. The only problem is it's on a Tuesday. So um, uh, sometimes if I'm not here, you'll know where I am. But certainly you can go in May, June, July, August, and even the beginning of September, depending on when it is. So those lectures are open to the public, and you are welcome to join them. That's how I came to know Kim Fink, and we also uh, owe him a debt of gratitude for being willing to come so quickly. We had a hole in the schedule, and by doing a little juggling, he was able to arrange his schedule to be here for us today. So for both of those counts, we will say thank you. His background is that he um, uh, holds a BFA from the Museum Art School in Portland and an MFA from the Tyler School of Art Temple University, as well as serving as a professor at the College of Southern Nevada and the University of North Dakota. And so with no further delays, we say welcome to Kim Fink. Thank you. Um, this is going to be in two sort of phases. I guess the first will be about my work, and then after the break, I'll be talking about uh, artists I've worked with and, to some degree, how they've been, how they've inspired me and affected my work. Um, so uh, I guess we'll just get started. And to start off, actually, I'm going to go with a very self-serving and selfish kind of a thing, uh, which is I'll be I'll be teaching a workshop this summer in Florence. Uh, Italy, and uh, so I'm throwing this out to you in case you're interested. It's a two-week program uh, where the first week uh, students will be going to, this is the uh, Arte Visive School of uh, Fine Arts in Florence, and uh, so it's called Make Print, Taste Chianti, and Live Florence. So the first week is actually traveling around Tuscany and drinking wine and eating food, uh, making a journal, and then coming back the second week and working in the studio with me to create a uh, like a journal, a printmaking mixed media journal uh, using photographic techniques. It's really fun. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, I've got some little handouts here as well, or you can look it up online. It's a really uh, great place. Uh, the other thing is that my wife and I, we've been here three years, we moved back here. We lived through in Oregon, I've been here since 1970 to go to art school and then left for graduate school, came back and then followed my, my profession, which was teaching. I got a full-time position in, in Las Vegas and was there for 10 years. Very interesting sort of, a, sort of experience. And then went to the University of North Dakota, which was, uh, for me was a, a great step because it's a research institution. I was able to do, do my own research and also had some funding to do some interesting things. Uh, so we moved back, I retired early, came back to Salem, where my, actually my younger daughter was born here. And um, we've been, spent the last three years since being here building a studio. So this is actually the studio, and that's my wife on the right there. And so it's a 24 by 40 foot studio, and we're trying to, we want to open this up to community and give lessons and actually have it as well for people who want to come and use the facilities, because I know printmakers in general oftentimes don't have presses to work with. So this is sort of the layout. Uh, this is my pride and joy, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about this because I love talking about this. This is a, an old press. It's about, uh, it, was, it was built pr approximately 1820 to 1830, so it's about 200 years old now. And uh, it's, it's a, called a Brissette, which is uh, Eugene Brissette is a fellow who, who manufactured this in France. Uh, I purchased this actually when I was a grad student in Italy. I worked on these presses and loved them. They're just, they're all wood. The only thing that's metal are the weights and the joints. Everything, everything else is wood. And it's just a really fun uh, press to work with. So I wanted, I've been lusting after this, one of these things forever. And uh, about 10 years ago, I ran across an ad after, after actually coming back from Florence, doing a workshop there. Uh, there was a, a print shop a studio called uh, Stone Metal Press in, in, in uh, San Antonio that actually was going belly up, unfortunately. So they were selling this press, and I went down there a couple times to check it out. 
I purchased it. Uh, the story goes, though, which I love the story, is this was um, owned by a master printer who was the first master printer at Tamron Institute. If any of you know of that place, it was uh, June Waynes, a woman who got a Ford Foundation grant back in the late 50s to reinvigorate lithography. It was actually a dying craft, a dying art. So she got this great uh, grant to start it back up, and she hired this fellow. And uh, he was a Czech Jew who actually uh, had to flee Paris, where he was living as a young man. Uh, it was Nazi-occupied. So he actually smuggled this press out of Nazi-occupied Paris. <laughs> now, how he did it, I have no idea. Uh, and I'm, I'm dying to find out. So I've been trying to contact. He actually, uh, he was fired by June after the first year because Printmakers at that time, they, want, they wanted to share the information, the technical information that they learned. And he is old school uh, lithographer, which back in those days, a lot of the Germans, a lot of the Italians, a lot of the French, they learned these techniques and they wouldn't share them. So there's like these really you know, amazing little things that they would do and wouldn't share them. And so the idea behind the Tamarind was to share, to train new people, and he refused. So they, the, both of them, June and this fellow, Barack, were, uh, were loggerheads, so she fired him. Uh, and he ended up going to University of Texas in Dallas, and that's where this was. Uh, when he left, he retired, went back to Paris, left the press there, and they sold this off at auction at some point about 20 years ago or so. So that's how it eventually came back to me. So it's been a real joy to work with and, and to play with. Uh, also, we do woodcuts. This is what's called a poster press or a, letter, uh, a proofing press. And a lot of printmakers now are using these because it's rather than burnishing something by hand as a woodcut, you can run this through a press real quickly after inking the plate or the wood block and uh, printing it really quickly. So it's a, a really fun kind of a uh, press that I uh, love to work with. And also a silk screen. I do a lot of that as well. So that's primarily what we have. Then my wife, of course, is a painter. This is her side of the studio. So far, we haven't been fighting over the space yet too much. Um, you can see that blue line down there. That's actually our... our <laughs> That's where, that's where the wall is going to go. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we'll see about that. Uh, so now I'm going to show you some of my work. And most, most of this is probably 10 years old and newer. Uh, this is called ACDC, which is sort of Ascent and Descent is what it's sort of short for. It's uh, roughly 32 inches by 34 inches. It's two panels. Uh, it's a woodcut. And um, the, one, the panel on the right particularly, you can see this. This is a technique I learned from an artist named Carol Summers, who is a, uh, was a woodcut artist uh, from Santa Cruz. Uh, initially, he was from Brooklyn, moved to Santa Cruz, and been there forever and ever. He just passed away about two or three years ago. I did a workshop with him. It's really wonderful. What, what I like about his work is he would do woodcuts, but he wanted to get away from the sort of hard edge uh, graphic look that woodcuts tend to have. So he would actually ink the back of the paper uh, after this, this, uh, this particular blue image here. Uh, I would print that up first, and then the background, once that dried, I'd ink the background with red ink, and then spray it with solvent, it would bleed through like a watercolor. So you get this kind of a really wonderful watercolor look. It would bleed into, uh, the, like you can see a little bit, the red comes into the green here and turns into kind of a purple, things like that. So you get some really wonderful, uh, wonderful kind of uh, techniques that happen with that. The one on the left is the same way, it's uh, actually white, and you can kind of see the top two-thirds that it's this kind of off-white, or a whitish in the bottom. is a, The bottom is actually the color of the paper itself, uh, which is a, a, an Asian paper, Japanese paper. Um, I have a, mo a lot of these are a series I did uh, right after, well, I don't know, how do we talk, how do we do this do, without being offensive? But anyway, this is a response to 9-11. Uh, so the whole series I did of those. Uh, so um, I taught it um, occasionally at uh, American University in Washington, D.C. They had, a, they had a, a satellite campus in Corciano, Italy, which is just north of Rome, about, about 50 miles or so. And I taught there a few times. Uh, my first time I taught was actually um, late September. So most of these students were in Washington, D.C. A lot of them had relatives, and they were pretty traumatized by what had happened 9-11. So uh, basically, I didn't teach that, that time I went there. It was basically just conjoling and talking to students and listening, doing a lot of listening, because they were pretty affected by that whole thing. <clears throat> so I started doing a, a series of works that kind of, I tried to portray in some way the feelings that I had. And one of the things I felt at that time was this, this uh, it's called the Rescuer's Release which is this guy just barely above water. He's, you know, his face is just above the water. He's kind of sinking. That sort of really precarious kind of feeling that, that you have when you're 
drowning or almost drowning. And that's kind of a feeling that I had at that time. So uh, a lot of the images I use uh, are images, they're graphic images I, I appropriate from mass media or from books. These happen to be from a, uh, I think it was a dictionary from around 1920. And uh, the way I liken it is, uh, it's almost like um, Egyptian hieroglyphs. Uh, a lot of these images for me have a personal sort of uh, feeling or phrase or idea. And so I'll reuse those images from time to time and sort of create a, a kind of a verbal um, vocabulary in my work. And as far as um, uh, people understanding that, uh, I'm really not too concerned about that. I know, you know a lot of artists want to portray what they've, what they've done and be understood. And I think there's a, real, there's a lot of merit to that. Uh, the way I approach it, it's a little bit different. I think just a, little more, a lot more personal. So uh, it'd be great if people understand what I'm trying to do, but if you don't, you know, and you interpret your own way, that's, that's totally fine. And that's very much a, a 21st century kind of ad, attitude that artists, I think, do have, postmodern. This is a, a four panel piece. Um, it's an allegory. I thought I'd give, my, give it a try, trying to do an allegory. So working with love, death, uh, life, um, happiness, things like that, so themes. So this is a four panel piece. I'm actually still working on this. I've got a fifth panel I've been doing. And I've been working on this uh, since 2007 or eight. So it's been about, how long is that? 10 years, 11, 12 years, something like that. And it's ongoing. Each one of these is a roughly 34 by, tw by 32 inches. So it's about 34 inches high and about 160 inches wide, something like that. Um, here's a detail one. This one is, uh, I believe, life. Now this one, I, I, the other day I mentioned this too, but this little, there's a character right there. That's my, my daughter, my younger daughter. She's, she's kind of a smart ass, so I thought I'd stick her in there <laughs> just, just for fun. Um, so this, thing, uh, this has to do with uh, enlightenment or knowledge. And so I took the, the, in the dictionary, I took the definition literally out of the, uh, the, that text and I put it in this here. So you can actually read starting at his foot. You can work all the way around and kind of go, as you go around and around, you go in and in and in, and you read the, the whole definition of what, what that is. Now, woodcuts, it, it, most of you, if, if you haven't done prints before, the print re reverses. So when you do things like with text, you have to do it backwards. Uh, so it can get kind of difficult. And sometimes you don't know until you actually print it if you screwed up or not. <laughs> so I tend to be kind of lenient with myself. If I screw up, it's like, ah, it's okay. It's another one. This actually happens to be death. So I looked around trying to find different kinds of symbols in different cultures that sort of suggest death. Uh, there's the fish, for example. Uh, this really relates to, I grew up in Central California with a, real, a little town that's about 60, 70% Hispanic. And it's, that's very much affected me. So uh, I see that as part of my culture growing up. So uh, this has, to me, a lot of people say well, this has sort of, a, sort of a Mexican feel to it. And I said, that's, yeah, that's fine. That's probably right. A uh, smaller piece. And this, again, this uh, fellow, these two fellows, again, it's that sort of idea of balance and um, not quite, you know, these, they're not quite balanced yet. So this is kind of, a, kind of a situation where they're not quite right. And it's that whole, again, that whole series I was working with. Uh, this one I did a, I do a lot of residence, I love doing residencies. I did, a, did one in Venice. Uh, about five years ago, and of course you've probably heard that Venice is underwater now. Uh, it's really, it's really, it's really sad. And we were there during Aqua Alto. So they said now, I think I heard on the radio this morning that it's up to the up to your knees, which is about 10 or 12 inches higher than I think normal. So I don't know. They're really concerned about, of course, uh, the art and, and uh, other architecture. But this one uh, is more pretty literal. It's the news, local newspaper here on the left-hand side. And this is actually a grate that's at the, at the workshop, at the studios that I worked at. It's just kind of a neat image I like, so I put that in there just for fun. The top, this top band here is all lithographs. This is done on Asian paper as well. It's very thin paper, but it's also very durable. Um, the rest of this was done with relief printing. I did a workshop uh, at the Center for Contemporary Printmaking in Norwalk, Connecticut, just north of New York City. And uh, when I got there, I didn't uh, have a lot of the materials that I needed. And one thing I like about doing residencies is that sometimes you're challenged. You don't have what you need, so you make do with what you got. And I just, I kind of love that sort of idea of, of making something work. 
so this was actually done with uh, using um, compressed cardboard for the most part. Um, this was a series I did just before, just before leaving North Dakota. Uh, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of talk about fracking and that sort of thing. Uh, so this one is, um, I'm trying to remember, recall the title of this, but um, it, there's the text in there, that's actually in gold. You can read, pretty much read some of that. Again, that's taken from a text that I got that talks about this, the environmental impact of, of fracking. And uh, so I think this is called Gambler's Delight. Of course, there's the, you know, the two guys, again, they're sort of tre treading water, and then there's the, the dice on top. Um, the top part, you see those stains up here. I um, wanted to make this a little bit more literal. So I had a student whose brother worked in the oil industry doing fracking, and I asked him, can you get me some uh, oil, some raw oil that I can use to actually print with? And he said, sure, we'll do that. And uh, I had traveled around, I've been traveling around North Dakota, we'll get into that a little bit later. I bought a Coke bottle that said it was actually fracking oil. When I opened it up, it was just dirty water. Somebody was selling the stuff <laughs> as oil, and it was, it was a, you know, you get people who want to take advantage. Anyway, this stuff happens to be the real thing. And I mixed that into my inks and printed it, because I thought that was kind of important. Um, and the, it's, the raw oil is like uh, dirty gasoline. I was really surprised. I thought it would be like sludgy or something, but it's just like a dirty gasoline. Uh, another one's called oleophilic and hydrophilic. I love lithography, and those are terms that are used a lot in, in lithography. Oleophil oil, oleophilic means oil-loving, hydrophilic means water-loving, and that's the basis behind lithography, water and love, oil-loving. So again, this is a text uh, that's, this is a woodcut, it's a relief, and then uh, silk screen on top is text that talks about the oil patch statistics, Williams County Sheriff and, and uh, Deputies Association in Bismarck, North Dakota. So it talks about that again. And again, the top part is uh, actually oil. And it's uh, from the Bakken oil fields. Um, a lot of times I work in sort of a uh, uh, linear kind of a way here. These are actually from sketchbook that I, that I have. And it, this is called Five Day. It's just literally things that I experience. I like to, you know, I, I found that when I, when I draw, when I'm traveling, uh, and look back at years later, I have a much more vivid memory of that than if I had taken a photograph, for example, just the way I, I work. Uh, so these are actually uh, images that I, I've gotten some of my travels. On the left-hand side actually is in Perugia, uh, or Corciano, it's the central Italy. It's just a landscape, a sketch I did. The one next to it, I did a workshop in, in San Francisco at Crown Point Press. And next door, if you look at it, there's this big, huge uh, strip joint. And it's got this really wonderful, uh, Golden, it's called the Californian. It's so the, 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 the type is like as big as this room. It's just huge. And so that's actually a detail from that that says the Californian. So that's kind of that remembrance. <laughs> this little dancing fellow in the middle was, uh, I had gone to Venice to the uh, Biennale. And this was a, in a hotel lobby, just a little sculpture of a little dancing guy. So that's kind of a memory. Uh, the purple one over here is uh, I was teaching in Corciano and I, I went to Rome to do a lecture at RISD. And um, I got an earache, so I went to the uh, apothecary. And what's wonderful about a lot of things is that it's, it's pretty disappearing now, but they wrap their, uh, like their fruit, they used to wrap it in these really beautiful printed uh, sh you know, papers, uh, and same, same thing with their drugs. So I got this little wonderful uh, image uh, wrapped in my, in my drugs I got from them. And that's that, literally, that's the, the image. And all right, just, I'm just goofing around a little bit. Um, so that just is sort of a, a little uh, travel thing for me. Um, I hope this is in sequence. Now, I wanted to show a little bit about how I work. Um, what's called variable additions, that's actually a, a process that's about 10 years old, maybe 15 years old. And uh, a lot of printmakers, what they do is they, they, it used to be like when I was taught, I was taught by a, a Tamron master printer, everything had to be exact. Each print was exactly the same as the other one. And you did 10 of them, they're exact. And if they weren't, then they weren't part of the edition. A lot of artists are, have been pulling away from that idea and getting into the idea of variable editions, which is something I was trained as a painter. I approach my printmaking like painting. So uh, oftentimes printmakers will have uh, a very definite idea about what they've got. They maybe even have a drawing that's down to the details and they just basically replicate it as a print and they make those. Uh, I've done that and it's, I find that extremely boring uh, so what I do is I approach it like a painting. So I'll start with maybe an idea or maybe one little 
uh, image and I'll build onto that. Uh, the problem with that is that about 50% of my prints usually are no good. They're, they're because I made the wrong choice, the color's crappy, I'm, it's not to my standard or whatever. So this one uh, is again based on um, Bush's uh, response going into Afghanistan. So it's a, a series called Take That. So it's a lot of these uh, Greek uh, masculine guys beating the crap out of somebody. So it's just idea of you know, b you know, b uh, beating your chest, you know, kind of thing. So um, there's some things I've gotten like uh, out of a, a military manual is how to dress for uh, chemical warfare, things like that. Again, these guys are kind of precariously balanced, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and then this little middle one, which is a little angel, and it's sort of a sort of a text thing. Now, I, I did the same thing with this. I printed these colors. Uh, I printed this as a white, and on the back I inked it brown and sprayed it, and then it kind of bled through. And then on top of that, I did silk screen. So all the colored stuff that's on top of this is uh, silk screen on top. And the middle part actually here is actually gold leaf. So I actually glued that and did a gold leaf thing on top of that. So it's really kind of very much a mixed media works on paper, which is what I, I call them for the most part. Here we go, so there's another variation of that. So you can see, now I did about 10 of these and I think I've only got three or four that I liked. So the rest of them, you know, so I, you, you sort of, I feel like sometimes I'm not wasting my time, but I'm wasting a lot of materials, which, you know, if you're on a budget, kind of, you know, you're aware of that. Uh, but that's the way I work. And so uh, they're really not edition prints, they're, they're more like uh, one of a kind kind of things. Uh, living in Las Vegas, this is just sort of my my take on that. You know, you, on the top it's like really hot, and the bottom you you know you're lusting for jumping in the pool, <laughs> kind of thing. These are relatively big. They're probably uh, 20, 26 by 36, something like that. Uh, this is a little bit smaller. Uh, again, I did this one in in Italy right after 9/11. This has to just more like, you know, it's a lot of uh, references to. You know, like there's George Washington and Lincoln and in, in red, white, and blue. Uh, there's text here that have to do with things that are, you know, sort of pretty much important to us. Like there's country, church, beach, uh, America, factory, all the things I th that sort of represent uh, America to me. And then there's uh, these things here, which is um, like a coloring book idea and very abstract. And then there's a little section right there. I think I've got a piece I'll talk a little bit about that. I reuse that quite a bit. It's actually a, a text uh, that we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, this one is um, Montalban. So on the left actually is Ricardo Montalban. During those uh, black and white, he was a gangster guy. And so I took an image from that. I like taking, uh, I could actually photograph images from the television and then, then shoot those uh, down. So this is actually a, a digital. On the left-hand side, it's digitally produced. And the right-hand side is all silk screen, and the bottom is silk screen as well. So it's this com com combination of, of uh, digital uh, computer work uh, and also hand work, which is something I'm really interested in as well. Um, I took a bunch of students to Oradia, Romania, um, about seven or eight years ago. And uh, we did a print exchange. I contacted the art school there. It's a very interesting place, uh, the art school. They, the, they're actually squatting in their school. The dean, uh, interesting guy, he uh, went to the president and said, I want to start an art school. And they said, well, we don't have room. If you can find space, you can have a school. So they actually found an old citadel, which is a 13th century citadel in Aradia. It's in northwestern uh, part of Romania, uh, in um, Transylvania. It's on the border between Hungary and Romania, and I, what's interesting is they don't like the Hungarians very well. They're not happy with those people, but uh, in any case, they, they're squatting in this place, and it's uh, an amazing facility. The rooms are probably 20 by 20. Uh, it's all uh, Romanesque uh, architecture, so these, you know, the low, rounded do uh, uh, doors, things like that. Thick, thick, thick walls. Uh, half of it's dilapidated, you can't walk into it. It's, it's dangerous, so they, they rope that off. The rooms that they use for, for classes, they have a little coal burner. Uh, they've just brought in these little coal burners and they warm up and it's cold there. I mean, when we went there, we went about uh, April and it was, it was cold. So uh, we're looking around and my counterpoint said, well, you know, if you, if you had stayed another week, we're having an art festival here in the basement. Uh, we emptied out the basement, it's just this, you know, cavernous rooms that go on forever. And they have like, you know, art shows and happenings and, you know, uh, 
projects where you can paint and do murals and just, you know, basically for the whole community to come in and enjoy. And she said, well, we're, as we were walking through there, she said, well, when we first came in here to do this, there was trash literally about waist high, just crap that had been, over the decades, been thrown into this. So they uh, were taking it out, and it's a dirt floor, and the dirt floor was pretty uneven, so they started uh, evening it out, and they started finding skeletons in there. And uh, the interesting thing is they had bullet holes in the back of the head. So it turns out uh, it was a uh, Nazi there, it was a Nazi stronghold or whatever. That's where they had their headquarters. And uh, Aradia, historically, is a Jewish settlement. And uh, so, and they're actually in the middle of trying to repatriate a lot of the, the buildings that were taken away during that time. Uh, so they, she said they had found about 100 bodies. And she said, in fact, you know, if you want to take a look at some, there's a bag over there. Let's go take a look. Maybe that's when I saw you. Nah, nah, nah. And so she opens up. It was, luckily, it was just trash. But they'd knocked another wall uh, down, and uh, they hadn't gotten to that yet. And so we walked into there, and the, the ground was spongy. It was just really, really cre creepy. And this is one of the situations where this image just came to my head. It was just, it's just like this, I had to do this. So uh, it's actually cast paper with uh, sticks around it. And um, there's a detail, too. There we go. Uh, and it, just, it was just one of those things I had to do. So it's roughly. I think about 12 by 12 feet, something like that. And this is called, it's called uh, Citadel Campo di Fiori, which is uh, in Italian, which is a field of flowers. OK, here's some text. I use this a lot. My I've done a lot of geneal genealogy, uh, and my dad is uh, Palatinate German, which is a particular part of Germany, southern and western Germany, that sort of uh, borders France. And the story goes that. I think it was part, they said it was part of the Hundred Years' War, but France would overrun Germany, and Germany would take it back and overrun France, it went back and forth, back and forth. This town was on the border, so they kept getting overrun by the French, then getting taken back. And so at some point, the whole, the whole town said, okay, enough, we're getting out of here, and they left. And they came to America, so the Palatinate Germans. Uh, so this is actually um, a lithographic stone that I have, and the text on there is, I found this uh, doing research, and it's actually a letter uh, written not by a serf, but for, you know, he paid somebody to write because he couldn't write. And this is a letter to his lord asking for release so he can leave. Uh, so in, in essence, he, it was trying to get out of his, his contract of slavery so he can come to the new world. I thought that was really interesting. So it's, uh, it's sort of a piece that has to do with, you know, rock being sort of eternal, and then this letter, which generally is very, very fragile kind of thing. Uh, I don't know what to think about this. I, there's, I get some found objects. And one thing about uh, North Dakota is when they have the big thaw, things as the, melt, the, sun, uh, the, the uh, snow melts and the ice melts, you find really weird stuff. And uh, I found this uh, near the studio. And it's actually uh, it's something about a guy in, Hen I think it's in Henderson, Nevada. I'm not sure. But uh, I guess that idea of sort of rock eternity kind of thing and then the and text. So it's, you know, it's not really an art piece, but it just, for me, it's just kind of fun. So I just like to throw it in. Uh, it's kind of an idea, I guess. It just sort of, for me, it just sort of struck something. Uh, kind of interesting thing. Um, this, this is more, more recent things. I started doing these things about five or six years ago. And this is actually a, a digital panel. There's a, one, two, three, four of them, actually. So it's about 22 inches high by about 120 inches wide. And this is kind of dedicated to my dad a little bit, but there's a, there's a poem on there, and it's by Li Yong Li, who's a poet, he's a, from China. Uh, he came to America, immigrated to America when he was about five years old. His dad worked for the Communist Party, and was, fell out of favor, and was had run out of the country. They escaped uh, being tortured, ended up in Hong Kong, and then came to America. And he's now teaching, uh, I think, in Indiana University, something like that. Really interesting guy. And uh, so this poem is from Blossoms. And he writes a lot about um, that, this stuff. But this really struck me as it reminded me of my father. He's basically is a, about a kid who goes with his father to pick peaches. And uh, he's, the boy is like five years old. He can't really hold a lot. But he's, and he's weighed down by all these peaches, and he's trying to catch up with his dad when they're leaving. He's got all these peaches. And it's just, it's a wonderful, beautiful kind of a poem uh, that talks about father and son. So that's sort of dedicated to my dad. 
So that's what that poem is about. It's uh, digital, but there's also silk screen on top of it, and then uh, you really can't see it too much, but over here, there's a lot of gold leafing, and this kind of funny little skull thing is actually a digital print on uh, um, silk, which is very sheer, so you can see through it. So there's actually a, the printed image of the skull, and then the silk image on top of it, so it's sort of on top of itself. Uh, it just gives it another kind of a dimension, which I think is kind of interesting. Uh, same kind of idea. This is, uh, I don't know, like just sort of weird things. This is Dante's Inferno. It's like, you've probably seen this in books. It's, it's uh, basically a graphic illustration of Dante's Inferno, where, you know, heaven and hell kind of thing. Uh, this is Bob's Big Boy. If you know Bob's Big Boy. Driving from California to, to Nevada, he's, there's a Bob's Big Boy. And, it's, you know, as a kid, I used to go there all the time. So I had to get Bob's Big Boy. And a color TV, which is sort of ancient now, right? Color TV. It's, uh, you know, what, what is that? So um, that is actually kind of a thing. There's Las Vegas sort of, in, there's a sort of strange thing to me in terms of art. It's a very small art community, maybe, maybe about 100 artists. Uh, but Las Vegas being Las Vegas is like anything goes, that kind of attitude, which is really kind of freeing in some ways as an artist. You know, there's no rules, so to speak. And there's a lot of questioning about what is art. And you'll see a lot of tacky stuff there, but it's kind of an interesting place in that respect. So that, this is sort of a dedication to that as well. And here's the detail of this. So each one of these uh, is a little circle that's cut out. It's 400, 400 pound watercolor paper that's been printed. Uh, I actually printed this twice and then I cut them out uh, and then re, re set them up again, one on top of the other. So it's the same image twice. Uh, and it's uh, what's called diamond dust. It's actually a, a glass that's been ground up and then I glued that on top of that. And then I use insect pins to pin on each one of those. And when I, when I did, gave this talk at Salem, my wife reminded me that was her job. And she was not happy about it. Because <laughs> you can see there's uh, hundreds of those things. And she had to pin those up. So that was her job when we were installing the show. And I, I thank her for that. Uh, this little book, this is actually two by three inches. And it's uh, called Book of Everyday Things. So I took objects uh, that I thought were kind of fun and cute and uh, printed them up, and then uh, the same kind of idea where I'd ink the back and then spray it and then it bleed through. So you get these really beautiful kind of colors in there. So this is, I think it's the only shot I have of that, yeah. And I've started to, to I'm starting to work three-dimensionally, and this one, I, I really like this one a lot. It's called Look, See It. I don't know if you can see the text in there. It actually does say, look here and see there. And what I did was I sandblasted the word look in that uh, side of the glass and the C on that one. So when you when you cast a light onto it, it'll cast a shadow that says look C. Okay, that's the idea. So I thought, well, I'm gonna take this a little bit further. So this wood here is actually called paper wood. It's very very thin. It's like probably like 400 pound watercolor paper. Uh, you can buy it commercially, and I mounted that on top of actually a piece of wood. But before I did that, I uh, put the glass on top of my glasses after I sat, if I can explain this correctly, I had the, the text on that. Okay, I put that on a piece of wa uh, paper with a strong light outside, so it cast that shadow, and I photographed it. And then on the computer, I erased the, f I erased the glasses, but left the shadow, and then printed that on top of this. And then I put the glasses back on top of that. So that shadow actually is not real, it's printed. Does that make sense? And so even the, the paper, I don't know if you can really see it really well, but that paper, the same thing, I printed that as well. And uh, then what I like to do is actually uh, in the gallery is get a strong light from another angle so you actually have two cast shadows. So you can't tell which one is the real one and which is the fake one. So, and the idea of look-see is when you look at something, you know, the, the, again, it's sort of a verbal thing. When you look at something, you're looking. When you see something, you're understanding it, right? That sort of idea. So it's like feel and touch. When you feel something and when you touch something. They two, mean two different things. Uh, there's just kind of interesting dichotomy, dichotomy. So that's what I'm kind of playing with now is that sort of idea of text. Um, this is called Butterflies. It's just a thing I did. It's actually about three by four feet and it's uh, silk screened on top of plexiglass and behind it is a mural that's painted yellow to sky blue and then it, it's, it hangs down. And then uh, with, you can't see it here very well, but if it's, again, cast shadows, you get all these hands all over the place, uh, which is just kind of fun. So I like to play with the space and play with the illusion. 
um, you know, around the time of after 9-11, so, you know, report suspicious activity. And I thought, I'm gonna have fun with that. So this is the first one I did, and actually if you look closely, there's a face there. If you sort of squint, you can see a face. So there's the eye, there's an eye there, there's an eye there, there's the nose, and there's the mouth. Uh, and so this again is sandblasted, and then, uh, then uh, I installed uh, this frame, which is about an inch deep, and I put uh, what's called string lights, and it's run by battery, and you turn that on, and the string lights are, are red, so then the, the report suspicious activity glows. And this is something I learned from a, a guy, that I, a museum uh, guy that I work with, uh, and he does a lot of installation in automobiles, and he said that's how they do, if you, you know, if you look at your radio, for example, a lot of that stuff is done like that. They actually sandblast the glass, and they use light that goes into the, into the glass itself, and you get this kind of a non-existent uh, text that lights up in different colors, which is kind of cool. Uh, so that, I had to do that. And then just, you know, the idea of, so, okay, let's go crazy, let's be stupid. So here's, you know, suspicious activity, you know, just a clown family, you know. Uh, this again is uh, sandblasted plexiglass. And I think in this case, though, I actually inked that text instead of using light. This is, this is day glow orange. I'm sorry the color's not that hot, but it actually glows in the dark. <laughs> so again, just, you know, on the internet, I just find, you find these really weird photographs, you know, like this one's crazy. It's just this bomb going off in the background. It's amazing. Uh, one of the last things, this is uh, uh, to be or not to be. It's uh, a very small piece, and it's called Poetic Justice, so it's you know, to be, not to be. So. Uh, and it's all um, uh, gold leafed, so I just like, got this idea of, of gold leafing everything. I kinda, I'm kind of going crazy with that, I'm gold leafing everything. I don't, it's an addiction at this point. Yes. Uh, I can't hear you when oh, you talk to the Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. Okay, and I think that's actually it, except if you want to go to Florence. <laughs> okay, I guess, yeah, that's it for this first half. I think we're doing okay. okay. I'll make a point of talking into the microphone next time. Thank you, Kim. I think some of us um, have some experience with different kinds of pigments, oil, acrylic, watercolor, but could you talk a little bit about inks and uh, the inks that you're using? Are those the same kinds of inks that we would put into our pens if we still use those? And um, uh, I'm, I'm also interested in what, you were, what hap happened with the oil that you turned into an ink. Yeah, these, these inks are not... Um there, there's what's called viscosity in inks. There's certain, the stiffness and looseness of inks. These are actually printmaking inks. Uh, a lot of them are lithography inks because I just, that's something I've just always worked with. Um, pretty much it's very stiff. It comes in one pound cans, around $25 for a can or $45 depending on the color. Um, so that, it, it gets expensive. So when you're inking the back of that, those papers, if they're like, you know, two by three foot, you're using a lot of ink. And so it's, you know, it gets, you try not to think about the expense, but that's sort of the nature of the, the game. But it's a thicker ink, and uh, they're ground, uh, it's ground pigments. Usually they're very good. This, uh, Hanshi is the brand I use. It's, a, uh, it's a historically a really good brand out of New Jersey, I believe. Uh, litho inks are stiffer. Uh, there's actually etching inks. If you've ever heard of etching or intaglio, those are a little bit thinner, and they make them that way so you can actually wipe them with your hands, because uh, what you do is you rub, uh, ink into the burnt or uh, etched areas on, on a surface of metal plate, and then you wipe that off, and what stays into the grooves becomes the print. So they make it so it's a little bit uh, easier to wipe. Uh, so it's actually relatively stiff stuff. And there are things that you can add to, they're what they call additives. You can add things to the inks to make them stiffer or to make them looser. Um, varnishes or uh, even like solvent to just make it thin, to make it run. But generally, to make it run like the, the things I do is I roll it on pretty stiff and then spray it and then it kind of bleeds out, uh, that sort of thing. 
So what inspires you for the, the individual uh, pieces of work that you do? Um, boy, just about everything. You know, I, a lot, somebody asked you the other day about the, the titles, and, and a lot of the titles uh, come from just, you know, what I read and what I listen to. A lot of it comes from, like, you know, Dylan, Bob Dylan, some of his songs, or maybe a book I'm reading, there'll be a phrase that really kind of catches my eye. And oftentimes that'll suggest uh, an idea as well. So, uh, hard to say, but often just my own experiences, what I'm seeing, like, like those skulls, uh, that one just came from, you know, being there and having this experience, this amazing experience, and just having to do it. That's probably more, one of the more literal things I've ever done. But uh, the other, other ways, as I mentioned, it's really kind of a general idea, uh, and I try to work into that, like a painting. That's how I, how we, I always describe it, is, is uh, more organic. A lot of printmakers, like I mentioned, are very, very defined about what they do. They know exactly what it's going to be, and they do it that way. And I just find that boring. I don't want to waste my time doing that. So uh, it'll come from from different sources, but just generally what I read, what I hear, uh, ideas I may you know discuss with somebody, things like that. Hi, this is Deanna. Yes. Um, when you find images on the internet or use photographs, do you have to worry about copyrights or any? I mean, how do you? If discern I, whether it's okay yeah. to use it or not use Something it? Something I've, 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 uh, I've really um, thought about that a lot. And I th I've come to the conclusion I have to worry about it unless I become famous. <laughs> <laughs> then somebody will want to sue me and then it'll be a problem. Then, I'll, then it'll be, you know, okay, that's fine. But I don't, basically, I, I, don't have, I don't worry about it. A lot of times, uh, what do they call it? There's uh, commons. Uh, some of you may know that word. There's a... Uh, some things after 100 years, they run, the, the copyright runs out unless it has been redone. So like a lot of the 1920s images I showed you, those are common now. They're not, they're not uh, copyrighted. So there's no real problem. I think it would be if I were to, uh, like the one that says uh, the face on it that, uh, that says report suspicious activity, that could be an issue uh, because that was taken off of, a, uh, it was actually a demonstration that somebody had done about how to digitally make a face. Uh, so that you know, if that person sees that they may, you know, it might, might might be an issue. But I've also altered it quite a bit, so it would sort of be up to debate in terms of whether I'm literally copying it and also whether I'm making money off of it. And I can tell you, I don't make money. <laughs> I don't I don't sell my work that much, so I don't. It's not a worry. I mean, they can if they want to sue me, go ahead, see what they can get out of me. <laughs> but yeah, it is a concern. It can be a concern. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a good question. Yes. This is Bill. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> there is a printing technique that the Provincetown printers call white line printing. Yes. Have you ever experimented with that? I've looked into it, and I'm you know there's a woman who sort of made that famous. I I can't think, recall her name now, but it's a it's an incredible process, and I think I actually tr researched that to actually try to teach it to my students, and uh, it's. Uh, I couldn't do it. It's, uh, but it is an interesting one. And I, if you know um, Edvard Munch, the, the Norwegian artist Edvard Munch, what I like about artists who are not printmakers but they make prints is they don't know rules. And so they do stuff that's not like a printmaker. Goes, you can't do that. But well, why not? I'm, you know, I'm not a printmaker. I don't care. And what he did was he took a scroll saw and he would actually cut out uh, his woodcuts. He'd cut images out, ink them separately, and put them back together like a puzzle, and then print it. And it's, that's something similar to what that, the white line is. Um, it, it's a fascinating process. I, I love that process. But it's uh, yeah, something I, I can't do actually. One of the things about it is it's unique. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's um, my understanding is it's technically it's pretty hard to do. Yeah, so, nah. <laughs> That's why I do silkscreen, because it's, it's really quick, and it's pretty fast, uh, and it's pretty, e no, I don't want to say easy, it's not, that's not the right word, but you can lay things down. And, and for me, the, the sort of the, the creative process, and I've talked to a lot of artists who do work this way, a lot of printmakers work real slow, and um, that's okay, but sometimes, you know, working faster to get those ideas out to go to the next thing is important. And that's kind of how I, why I've ended up doing like Silkstream because it's a little faster so I can speed those ideas up and, and make those mistakes instead of right away and know that they're mistakes versus spending a lot of time then, you know, being frustrated kind of thing, if that makes sense. Hi, 
Okay, this is uh, Carmen, and um, I have a couple of uh, prints from uh, Chef Levine, who is an art professor in Corvallis at yes. Oregon State. Have you met him? Uh, unfortunately, no, but my wife did, did take a class with him. Uh, prior, yes, yes, and uh, well, what was interesting is the two prints were of flamenco, uh, dan well, one was a dancer and the other was a guitarist, but I noticed that the guitar was being held in the opposite way that most guitarists would hold. And I was thinking maybe that's the, that's the way he, he actually made him a boo-boo uh, and wanted uh, and put the guitarist on there and then it did opposite. Yes. And, but I, I did say something to him and said that most guitars aren't held that way. He's, so he said, uh, he was my neighbor, <laughs> he, he said, well, you know, that particular artist in Spain held his guitar that way. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think I embarrassed him a little, and I apologize to him too late now. That was but, a good save uh, on his part. I realized <laughs> that I maybe opened up a wound or something. <laughs> Thank you. That was a good save on his part. That's awesome. <laughs> Yes. Uh, this is Irene, and Hi, Irene. I saw that you have this studio art in Florence, but I was interested in your studio here in Salem, and you said you had plans for classes or something. Did you say that? Yes. And I wondered what the plans are and how all that would work. <sighs> Good question. <laughs> uh, my wife and I are talking about it. Well, it's, it's pretty much the studio is done, as you've seen, but right now we're working on getting heat in there. Um, and that's the big next big step. But no, the idea is I've, I've uh, that's you know with printmaking it tends to be a communal thing anyway. And I've uh, I, my first full time teaching job was at a community college. And I took the community literally when I took that job. And it was very important to me to be part of the community. And as a printmaker, I just I love working with other artists. And I love that whole that whole thing where you're you know you're working with other people and you're you're working on ideas and you're solving problems and that sort of thing. So. Uh, that's one of the first things we did when we came here is we're, we knew we were going to do a studio and we, do you want to do this as an open studio? And we said, yeah, absolutely. And I don't know that there's any studios in Salem that are studios where people can go to. And that's why we want to do that. So it would be for a fee, I suppose, you know, to like a rental fee, a key fee kind of thing if you wanted to come and just work. And if we were to do classes, we could, you know, uh, my wife and I have talked about this, it could be an individual thing or it could be a group thing. Uh, my wife wants to involve wine in this, which, you know. <laughs> so, you know, that's, but yeah, I mean, that we very definitely want to do that. Uh, and um, I don't know, at this point, um, I can give you my email address and, and that sort of thing, and we can c sort of go from there. But it's, it's something we definitely want to do. Uh, we're all, actually, we're off of, we're on West Salem, though. I don't think that's a problem, but it's uh, off of Wallace, about a mile up the hill there on Herit, so it's near Herit, uh, Herit School, the grade school in that area, sort of. Yes? Hi, Deanna again. Um, maybe you already said this, but I don't think you did. Do you do acid etching process? And if so, could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Well, there's two, two processes that are acid etching. The, one, the most obvious is, is etching or intaglio. Uh, we don't do that in our studio. Um, Mainly because of the uh, the chemistry, it's it's dangerous. Nitric acid, uh, phosphoric acid. There's uh, w wonderfully. I mean, there, there's ways that they're developing processes that are less uh, dangerous. Like breathing nitric. In fact, I've got a mild asthma, and it's from from that. I, I'm sure. Just over the years, uh, in it, with working over etching vats and things like that. Um, but now uh, they're actually using other like salts, certain kinds of salts that are they're not toxic, but they look like iodine. They're stain. They're kind of you know, but they work really well, and it's, you don't have to worry about uh, breathing it too much, you know, the, that sort of thing. Uh, and it works really well with copper and zinc, which is typical for etching. Those are those things. Uh, we don't. I don't have a press for that, unfortunately. The other one, the other etching part is lithography, where you actually do etches using nitric acid, very small amounts of nitric acid. And the idea is that water and oil don't mix, and uh, so you draw onto a litho stone or aluminum plate with a greasy material, usually a pencil, and then you uh, give that an etch, which has mostly gum arabic, which is a water-soluble pitch for, for the most part, 
and a little bit of acid, and it gives that drawing a memory. So it makes it drives the grease of the drawing into the stone or plate. And the negative areas, it makes it water resistant to grease. So at the same one, it makes one area grease loving, the other area water loving at the same time, which is wonderful. And then you ink it up. You have to keep it wet while you're while you're inking it, uh, but it's a real fun process. So those are the two main etching processes, um, and that we do. We do lithography and photolithography, things like that. But at this point, no etching. We, we need you need a specific press for that, and we don't have it. <laughs> Okay, why don't we go ahead and take a 10 minute break. We'll get back together at 12.32 and thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, I promise I'll try to talk into the microphone. Uh, by the way, just uh, uh, chatting with other people, but I do have these little handouts about this about the school in, in Florence, if you're interested. And I, you know, I'm so unprepared. I don't have. Uh, if anybody wants, oh yeah, thank you. If anybody wants my information, um, how are we going to do this? I don't have cards. I haven't had any made up since I've been here. But uh, it could be something that's posted on on the web page that you normally get here, and it will do that. So if you want to text me or email me or call me or whatever uh, about the workshop, the, the studio, that, you know, feel free. Okay, this, this is um, a little bit different. Um, my background is, is uh, I, I, like I mentioned, I was trained as a painter when I went to the art school in Portland. It's now called the Pacific Northwest College of Art, but I, I purposely call it the art school because that's museum art school because that's what it was when I was there. So, I, you know, I'm a, what do they call that? That's the, the latest thing is, okay, boomer. I'm one of those, I guess. So uh, I, liked, I like the old name, and it, it, you know, it just shows where I came from there. Anyway, I, uh, I was, my major was painting, but I uh, met this guy who was a master printer from Tamarind, and he was the first, first uh, director of education there. And just a wonderful guy, a real inspiration. And I was really interested in printing for other people and the whole idea of collaboration, which I still am. But the downside, talking to him, the downside is you don't have a life of your own. You don't have your art of your own because you're working for other people. In essence, what you're doing is you're taking somebody's art and making, making it for them. Uh, and it's a full-time job and it's, it's hard and all that stuff. And I've had a couple of opportunities over the years. I was offered a position at Black, uh, Blackburn Gallery in New York to print, for with, print with them and I said no. And then when I was a student in, in Rome, a, gr a group of artists actually approached me and said, we'll put you up in a little apartment if you print for us. And I said, no, which is that one I sure, what, what was I thinking? But uh, in any case, uh, there's that sort of, uh, I was worried about if I started printing that I, I would not do my own work and that's really important. But I still have that urge. Uh, so when I got to the University of North Dakota, there's a lot of funding there, and uh, we actually had $80,000 a year to spend, and we had to spend it. I started a, a visiting artist program there with no budget for about five years, and then we ran into this, this uh, endowment, and so we started bringing artists in. And the idea is, if you read this, it's a thing that I little blur by wit, but we called it uh, uh, Sundog Multiples, because uh, in North Dakota they have these things called sundogs, if you know what those are, it's reflections of the sun. Pretty weird, and pretty awesome to see. Uh, so it's a way of get, bringing in professional artists and having students work with them and producing prints. So the, uh, the arrangement was we'd pay them to come, we'd give them about $1,000, put them up, and work with them two or three days and create a print, and they would keep half the edition and the university would keep the other half for their archives, uh, which is a great idea and a great, great arrangement. And so that's how we started doing this. And um, so let's see here now, how do I... How do I make this large? Five. Five? Oh, F5, F5, okay. There we go, okay, great. Um, so we started out, uh, actually did a, a, a portfolio of, of uh, prints, uh, mostly lithographs and some silk screens um, with local artists uh, around Fargo and Grand Forks and that area, some, some in uh, Winnipeg, Canada and really enjoyed that, and that's what I was doing it for basically no, no pay. Um, then we started working with, uh, luckily there's on campus, there's a museum, uh, it's called the North Dakota Museum of Art. It's not associated with the university, it's actually its own museum, and it's a wonderful place. They bring in amazing shows, and uh, so luckily my, my wife is the director of, edu of education there. So when an artist would come in, I would ask her, well, can you sort of, you know, grease the wheels a little bit here for me and talk to the artist, see if they'd be interested while they're here, 
uh, do a little print. And I, there's only one time that uh, an artist said no, and that's when I, I had to go approach the artist myself, and she said no, and that was Anne Hamilton, I don't know if you know who that is. And she actually was working with a group of artists, uh, printers in Los Angeles. Turns out later I found out it was one of my students who was printing for us, so I was kind of mad at him about that. Uh, in any case, uh, they, they did this show uh, called The Disappeared, and it's a, to make a long story short, I was trying to, my wife was telling me, keep this short, don't get into it too much, but it was a show that the director curated. It was basically artists from Central America and South America who, in the 1980s and 90s, dealt with the disappeared. If you recall politically, there was a lot of things going on. America was involved, uh, but a lot of regimes were basically disappearing people. So they were, you know, they'd ride, ride their bikes to work and they'd never come home. Uh, they were abducted, never, never heard of again. So this sort of thing, it was really, really terrible situation. So these artists were all artists who had dealt with that in some ways. So um, one of them was this Os uh, uh, from Colombia. His name is Oscar Munoz. And I'm sorry, the spelling is really bad there. I, there's some little thing above the U that's supposed to be there, a little glitch. And I just don't know how to do it on my computer, so I'm so I apologize for that. He does these things that are very ephemeral. And I have a little video here. Hopefully, it'll play. Uh, and he really impressed me because he's not a, a printmaker. But uh, he came to town, and he was part of the show. And the director called me and said, well, you know, can you do help him make these these images, and uh, I said, sure, I'd love to. So they you know, paid me 50 bucks or something. I spent uh, two days with him, and you kind of get a sense of this from here, but this, there's a woman, these are actually uh, polished steel plates. They're about 14 inches in diameter. And then what he would do is he would silk screen this combination of clear plastic and vinegar combination, and silk screen it onto the plate and you couldn't see it. Uh, so it's literally printing blind. And um, he, we, he sat and worked with me, and I had a graduate student with me as well to do these. And we had to do, I think he had six of these, and we had to do six each. Uh, the, they were so delicate that, and the idea is you breathe on it. So you don't see anything, you breathe on it, and this image comes up like a ghost image, and it goes away. And so these are actually uh, faces of people who disappeared that he got from the newspapers. So these actually are, they're actually newspaper images. And so they're, you know, three by four inches or so. And you breathe on this thing and it, it, and it goes away. The whole thing is this ephemeral thing. And, uh, but the, the, gla this, the, the, the steel discs have to be polished perfectly. And you use lacquer thinner and clean it and it can't, can't have any uh, streaks in it. And you don't know there's streaks on it, even when there's streaks on it, because it's clear. And so uh, it was really frustrating because we'd you know, do this thing, print them, and then test it, and they'd be, they'd be, there'd be streaks in the face all over again. So over and over and over. And he called it alchemy. Is what it, it was kind of funny. And he just said, be patient, you'll get it. So we did get it. And, um, but they're so delicate. I asked him initially, because we were in the museum uh, basement doing these, and I said, can we take them to the studio where I work and do them there and bring them? He goes, no, it's so delicate that just the change of atmosphere, it'll disintegrate. It, you'll, by the time you get here, it'll be gone. And that's that whole idea behind this. Really, really fascinating. So um, here's a little video he talks about. I don't know if I can get this to work. Um, how would I do this? Let's see. There we go. I hope the volume is, you can read it. I don't know if the volume is, uh... nope, that's me, sorry about that. Gasto con mi trabajo de situarme o de eh, explicarme, indagarme, preguntar sobre el, el momento, ese momento en que la tinta hace contacto con el, con el soporte y puede o no convertirse en un documento que es, digamos, como metafóricamente hablando podría ser el momento en que nosotros eh, fijamos un recuerdo en la memoria bueno, en donde, digamos, se constituyen o se consolidan los recuerdos el polvo de carbón ha sido como el elemento que más he trabajado, digamos, con el que más al que más posibilidades le he encontrado expresivas. Sin embargo, además, he trabajado, digamos, otros materiales que me parecían muy pertinentes, muy pertinentes eh, de acuerdo al, 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 al trabajo que estaba eh, con el que estaba enfrentando. 
pero que eh, son elementales y son cotidianos como el vapor del aliento sobre la superficie de un espejo o el, eh, el, el café y, las, y el cubo de azúcar pero básicamente eh, la materia del carbón y el café Digamos, a mí tal vez eh, no me interesa tanto interpretar, digamos, desde un punto de vista la historia política, la situación política de Colombia, pero, digamos, mi percepción de la vida cotidiana, de la política, de la relación con el olvido, con, la, con los eventos que se suceden día a día, son determinantes para mi trabajo. Okay, so I think he's explaining that, and I've got a series of, of images here showing just what this, oops, showing just what this, uh, what he's doing here, and uh, you can see just this whole series here. I like this image too because if you look at the right, that figure on the right, you can see it's disintegrating already. And that happens. And what they do is they, they rotate them out. Once they disintegrate, they pull that one out and put another one in. He had a show in Santa Fe right after this, and they, they asked me to, do, to reprint all these, which was I did. And they were sent to Santa Fe. And then when they got there, they, they called up and said, you didn't do them. They're gone. I said, well, I did. But you know, remember, when it changes atmosphere, it, they destroyed. So I tried to tell them that, and they, they, but they didn't understand. And uh, so Oscar actually called them and said, yeah, don't worry about it, I'll, you know, we'll figure it out. But it's that delicate, which is amazing to me. Um, and just a fascinating way. I mean, this is a printmaker, I don't think, would think of this. And it really does sort of, here's the installation of them. It really does sort of speak to the idea that he's talking about, you know, about you know, life and how, how fragile it is. I don't know this one. I think, I think these are actually uh, digitally printed on, uh, probably on silk is my guess. And they're life size. Here we go, you can see the side of it. And I think that's him there walking through there. Two-way mirror, which I think is really cool. So very unusual materials. This is a sequence. Now when he talked about it, he was showing him do this. What this it's actually a video that he actually paints on cement and it's hot. So as he's painting, it's evaporating. So he's constantly repainting it and trying to make this image. And again, it sort of speaks to the idea of you know, life and how fragile and quick it is and how it goes away. And this is the installation they have at the museum, which is the, it's the same video, well, it's a similar video. There are three or four different portraits and they're running at the same time. So you can see them in different sequences. And you know, on the one on the right, for example, it's uh, ev evaporating. The same thing with the one next to that. Uh, just, just a fascinating way of doing it. Another installation here of that. Um, Audrey Flack, uh, she came, oh boy, she's great, but she worked us to death. Uh, she's a friend of the department chairs who is an art historian, and she came, and uh, we were supposed to do a couple of lithographs, and if you know her work, she's best known for doing photorealism paintings, and now she's doing sculpture. Um, so when she came, she said, well, I'm gonna do these, I wanna do these, uh, photo images of this sculpture I'm working on. And uh, so I got some students who are digital, you know, their majors working with uh, uh, graphic design. And so she gave them the images and they worked them up. So she's working with them. Here you can see that she's trying to get this sort of clay look out of it. So the, the proofs, the small proofs are in the middle there. She's looking it over with the students, telling them what, she, what they need to do to make it better. And then the images on the right. Uh, so those are all digital. And what she came up with, the idea was after about a week, we did a series of lithographs, but she wasn't too happy with them and decided to do these, these digital images and then work into them by hand with colored pencils. Uh, so here she is working, we, we set it up with her uh, to do this and uh, we had a graduate student who, um, there she is working with the color there. So she actually did these, uh, she did editions of them. So there'd be maybe five of these. And so she'd draw one, and then she'd say, and she'd show the student how to do it. Here's the sequence, here's how it's done, and you do it. And you know, nowadays, that's, it's, it's kind of frowned on that, that, uh, that artists have assistants doing their work for them. 
but that's actually historically, if you think about like the Renaissance painters, sometimes all they did was come and touch up things. That's all they did, their, their assistants did all the work. So it's not an unusual process. Um, so there's a whole series of her working on this. What was fun is while she was, while she was doing this, she was talking about, oh, you know, I was kind of young and, you know, J Jackson Pollock always hit up on me. And, you know, as soon as Jackson Pollock, really, wow. You know, she had all these crazy stories about, you know, New York at the time back in the 50s and 60s. And she's just a, just a, a pleasure, pleasure to work with. There's the grad student in the middle. And those, uh, the, those images there, those are lithographs there. They're photolithos that we did. She wasn't happy with the color. We just couldn't get the color the way she wanted it. And after about a week, she, she said, now let's just not do it. And uh, that, that was hard. It was hard to give it up. But it was hard to do it, too. So here we are doing some more. That's all the students they're, they're working with there. So they just got a lot out of this. It's just a really wonderful program that uh, students had. So here's a, a finished piece. And there's the photo litho that we're working on. So that the student on the left here, the guy on the left, he actually went to Tamarind. He's a master printer, which is great. He's now, and he, he as an undergraduate, he went to RISD. He just finished at RISD right now. And he's, he's trying to get a, he's actually trying to get a Fulbright. I think he'll get it this year, but he wants to go to Romania. <laughs> so go figure. He's a great guy. And there we're inking it up. Yeah, she just, we just didn't get the color. She just didn't, it wasn't the image, but the color was just not right. And she plays old time music, a banjo. So uh, we have some friends who play old time music. She says, well, if you have anybody has to play old time music. So she came over to our house, we jammed one night and had a lot of fun. So here she is playing. And she actually, if you, if you look her up, she actually has a couple of albums out with her. She's got a little group. Uh, and there's one, my wife on the left, they're singing, a, she did a song called Isms, a song like, you know, Impressionism, Realism, Photo, you know, it's, it's a funny song, but uh, she, she writes her own music as well. Uh, Samina Mansouri, she's an Af Afghani student, artist. Uh, I met her doing a, a workshop, or a, I was doing a residency in Connecticut, or not Connecticut, in uh, Vermont, Vermont Studio Center. And she was there, just, just graduated from, uh, graduate school in Michigan, and uh, does really interesting work. And I invited her to come do uh, some work at the school. So she talked about, you know, being an Afghan woman and being, a, a, you know, at that time, right after Afghanistan, being occupied by the Taliban, things like that. And so she does these, uh, actually, they're videos, and they're, they're called Ash. And I'll show you a couple of the details of them. Pretty, pretty somber. But uh, this is our, our photo, photo uh, uh, faculty here, and uh, she was helping us with uh, printing these things out. And she decided she wanted to give it a luster, so we're actually using um, uh, wax. So it's uh, encaustic on top of the print. And it's, it gives it this beautiful sheen to it. And there, there's a detail there. So if you look real closer, basically bombed out hovels. And she did a video of this, and it's, a very, it's very somber. It just goes over and over there. She made models and then filmed it going over this model, this long model. And all you can hear is a sort of whooshing sound of, of air, I guess. Um, and then Barton. Uh, the beauty of doing this is a lot of commercial shops, they, they have to stay open, they have to make money. So they, Whoever has money to pay them, they'll print for them. So they don't have a lot of say as to what, what they, uh, who they print with. I was eight fortunate to have the funding so I could ask people, so we could choose who we wanted. So I usually chose artists who had something to say socially or politically, usually socially more than politically. So it was very exciting for me to work with these people. This is Barton, my daughter on the left there. Wonderful guy. Um, he does, there, I don't know if you can see him, he's actually, this is a studio. He's right there. And uh, his studio is amazing. He, had, he, he passed away about five years ago, ago from AIDS. Uh, one of the longest surviving people with AIDS, actually. He's got it back in the 70s or 80s. Um, but he is, was uh, basically quarantined to his studio. And it's a very small, you know, maybe about 15 feet wide and about 40 feet long. And that was his, his living space and his studio. And he collected all kinds of stuff. And you, as you can see, there's like, there's a, this right here is a, I don't know, a 
giraffe. <laughs> I mean, the whole head. That had just come. The only problem with Barton is whenever he come to visit, he, he, he made me drink vodka. <laughs> so he did these pieces. I really, I just love his work because they're, they're found objects and he has people all over the world that f collect for him. And um, it, what I like about his work is it really makes you question what is art, but also what is collecting, and even what is valuable. So he'd like do random things, like here's, a, for example, here's a dollar note that uh, you know one of his friends who was uh, his NBC correspondent sent him after you know his the fall of, of uh, Saddam Hussein. These labels here, these actually are cigar labels that he, he'd he'd cut these out. And then they're sort of recessed, so that, that background, black background is like crushed velvet, and then the dollar's in there, so it's about an inch back or so. Um, here's another one. Calling card of Lenin's embalmer, Moscow, 1999. So he just got random stuff. Uh, when he passed away, we were working on a piece. This is actually his AIDS pills. He got so tired of this. He did a whole series of work with his pills. He'd make all kinds of things out of them. So a project we, the first project I did, I did with him called Wet Dreams, and he said it was really funny because it was either that or another one called Weapons of Mass Destruction. And uh, he said, well, you know, Wet Dreams, it sounds like a certain thing, but it's really not. And what it is is, uh, this, here's a fish dreaming of a goldfish bowl. And the, <laughs> so it's, it has to do with water. And so this is a fun one because it's, it's, con it's called a constructed lithograph. So the lithograph, is the fish. He sent me images of that and we photographically did those and printed those onto 400 pound watercolor paper, which is an interesting <coughs> technical problem or issue. And then that colored goldfish bowl was actually printed out uh, using archival ink on a computer and then cut out by hand. And then with that, I mentioned earlier, I had that one piece that has, uh, uh, it's called diamond dust. Uh, it's stuff that he used. He actually, he was a, when he was younger, he did um, display windows in New York, and he worked with Andy Warhol when he was when they were together. He was so he's that generation. <clears throat> he's an interesting guy because you, you'd never heard of him, but in, he's he's well known in New York, but outside of New York, nobody knows really knows about him. Um, these are roughly uh, size of a piece of paper. It's another one, a brush, you know, dreaming of paint. And this is the actual. Uh, the box. This is the enclosure that was. There's 12 of them, and so what was fun was, you know, again working with him. And I'd have these questions, you know, like, well, how do you do this? He'd go, well, you're an artist, figure it out. So it really was literally a, a collaboration. But he again sent me these images of shells online, and I printed those out, archival paper, and then we made a box and we glued it down. It's all archival, and then they slip in like a like a little, you know, and they're dimensional because they're uh, the like for example this. Oops, I'll go back up again. The cloud right there is cut out and it's, it's gl glued onto a piece of uh, uh, foam core, so it's about a quarter inch deep. Uh, so it's, there's depth to the prints, which is kind of fun. And there's, this, this, uh, there's a display of, the sh of that at the Museum of Mars, uh, North Dakota Museum of Art. <coughs> and this is one of the pieces, uh, this actually, he gifted this to my daughter, a piece that he did. And he said, well, this, if, if, you're, if you're ever to frame these, this is how you need to frame it. And all of his work does that. The frames are all replicated like this in some way. Uh, this is the last one we did with him. It was called uh, Prayer Rugs. And uh, it's made out of lines of stamps that he's collected. And <clears throat> so what we did was we digitally printed these out, cut them into strips, and wove them together, uh, each one of these. And here's, a, uh, here's actually the... <clears throat> excuse me, the, his piece. He did a mock-up for us to take, and we brought it back and, and did the mock. So what was fun about this was he was in the studio in New York. He sent me all the stuff you know, in North Dakota, and we worked together. And the, the trick was sending them back to him so we could sign them. So that was kind of fun in a way, because I'd usually send a student to New York to go pick these up for him, for us. And so they you know, have all these crazy stories about Barton and you know, went to, you know, doing things. <laughs> And there's a, there's, there I am with my students, we're weaving the, the prints. Uh, Art Spiegelman, he's a really, you know, you probably heard about him, he wrote a book called Mouse, got a Pulitzer Prize, he was the first uh, person to get uh, one of the illustrated books, like a comic basically. Um, 
uh, interesting, interesting guy. And um, he came as, we had, we have what's called a writer's conference at the university, and they bring all kinds of people. He charged, I think he was charging $20,000 a day. He was there for two days. So um, there's another artist I worked with, uh, Peter Cooper. He's actually in here. He's a graphic novelist as well. He works for the New Yorker magazine a lot and uh, that sort of thing. And we'd done some work with him. We hit it off really well. And we're trying to get a, I was trying to get a hold of Art Spiegelman to see if we could do a print with him. And he, he had to go through his agent. And so I said, I asked the people at the writer's conference, can you get a hold of him to see if he'd be interested in doing a print? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they kept saying, well, his agent, we can't get past his agent. He will not talk, the agent will not talk to Spiegelman. And so we can't do it. So I thought, well, you know, I, I wonder if Peter knows him. Because they're both in the same business, right? They're both New Yorkers. So I, I texted uh, Peter, and he was in Paris at the time. I said, do you know Spiegelman? He goes, oh, yeah, we're old friends. I said, well, we want to do something with him like we did with you. He goes, yeah, well, I'll let him know. And uh, yeah, we'll see. So I forgot about it. And a month goes by, and we're getting closer and closer to the, to the conference when he's going to come. Didn't hear, so I kind of forgot about it. And then one day at home, of all things, I get a phone call. It goes, Spiegelman here. <laughs> what do you want to do? You know, kind of thing. So we did this project, and uh, he came into town, and what they did was they were going to give me an hour with him to sign 50 prints. And I, I know how this works. 50 minutes is not, or 50 prints in an hour is not enough time. And he was going to give this big major talk to the university as a whole. And after that, they were going to sneak him over to me for an hour. And I just, I knew, you know, things being the way they are, that people are going to grab him, they're going to talk to him, blah, blah, blah. I won't have time. So I called uh, the hotel where I knew they were going to keep him. And I asked when he's coming in. They said, well, he's coming in the day before. So I thought, oh, OK. So I, I waited until that afternoon, the day before he's actually supposed to come on campus. And I called, and I asked for him. And he answered the phone. And I said, you know. Kim Fink, we're doing this project. Can you come in now? Because I know, you know, he goes, yeah, sure, come get me. So he came over that night, and we did the signing. So we're signing these things off. And uh, then he said, well, let's go, let's go, let's go to dinner. So I had, you know, my student, a couple of students, a couple of faculty, and myself. And so we took him to a, a place, and we had dinner, <clears throat> had a great time. And uh, when the writers' conference found out that we got him for the, for the evening, and he didn't charge us. It wasn't $20,000. They were pretty upset, but hey, what, whatever. You know? so, and, he, and he had some really, interest, really interesting stories. Uh, yeah. And that's his print there. It's called Remember Childhood. This was actually posted at the university on their web page. And down below, there's the word slut. And so they, they read that, oh, and they took it off. I thought, this is a university, come on. And I actually have a printer I brought. I brought some prints for you to look at if you want to look at them. And it's a fun print. It just basically talks about uh, growing up and, and, and how things have changed. That sort of thing is really fun. Here's Peter Cooper. OK, he's, a, he's a, a graphic novelist as well. He does a lot of illustrations. You've probably seen his work in New York, New Yorker. He also does, he's the guy that does Spy vs. Spy in Mad Magazine. He's that guy. So uh, there he is. He does my work. So he, uh, he actually, how did this work? He, he came to the writer's conference, and I'm always looking for people. So I asked him, do you know anybody who does, you know, they're writers, but they do any art? And he said, well, this Peter Cooper guy. So can we do a print? He said, well, yeah, he's got a, you know, some downtime. So he came over, and we had, he had so much fun. We did a lithograph with him. And at the time, he was living in, New Mex or New, living in, in uh, Mexico. I'm trying to remember this, the city. Uh, but he was having so much fun, we started doing more prints, more prints, more prints. He was just loving it. So he called and uh, canceled his flight and w gave us another, actually gave us a week. So we were there like a week and a half doing these prints. They just had a blast. It was really, really fun. Um, he teaches at Harvard, of all things, too. But uh, the thing about him is he started doing these books. And this one here is actually a two-page uh, piece. And um, he loves Kafka. So a lot of the stuff we do is Kafka. I'm sorry, it's a bad picture. It's kind of funny. But, and there's this one, uh, another Kafka thing. So we started doing these fold-outs. So there are, um, and there's one, two, three, four, five panels on this thing. And it's just basically folded out. And that was, OK, fine. We're having a good time doing that. I was learning a lot on how to basically make these sort of books. Um, and there's, there's a good example of that there. And there's all the prints. 
I mean, he was having lots of fun, and, and to, our <laughs> to our expense, <laughs> I was having fun too. There we go, there we go. there's that. Uh, that's the first one we did in color, and there's a sort of a black and white, the modest proposal. And I don't, that's, uh, I'm trying to think of the, 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 not, the, the writers on this, but basically it has to do with you know, uh, the government saying, you know, what are people whining about? You know, you're not giving them enough money. Why don't they just eat their, eat? so this guy said, well, why don't we just eat our babies? You know, it's just a really ludicrous kind of thing, but it's a, a, it basically a stab at, at the government and how they uh, fund things. Um, he, he, uh, he actually is a direct, or he's a director, editor for a thing called World War III. It's a magazine. It's been around for about 15 years. And uh, they had a show at, uh, in New York. There's a big show. It's all, basically the, all the graphic novelists, all the graphic artists who are, uh, anybody, uh, had a piece in this show. And so he said, uh, when he was there, the first time he said, well, you know, we have, we have this show in New York. Uh, would you like to have it? I said, well, sure, uh, yeah, okay. So we did, and uh, so we brought it, and it was, it was called Graphic Radicals, 30 Years of World War III Illustrated, which is this really great ma uh, magazine. Of course, it's very left-wing, you know, very, you know, the whole thing. But uh, it was really, really interesting. Here's what Spivey was about. He goes to the, he goes to the uh, uh, Comic-Con all the time in San Diego, so. Um, I love this one. This one just came out about a month ago, The New Yorker. Pants on fire. <laughs> There's another one here. This was actually a lithograph. He likes to do silk screens, and I did a litho, and he was really not happy about that, but it turned out great. Uh, he still likes silk screens. There it is. So I actually have, an, I have one of these here today to show you, too. It's a book. So all of a sudden, we started binding these things. They got bigger and bigger. and. Uh, there it is folded, and there's the front cover to that, and it's actually silver ink on it, so the vulture. And they're really great, they're really wonderful and fun. And what he does is, if I found out, is he takes these and he goes to Comic-Con and sells them, and, which is great. I mean, you know, he gets, he gets some money out of this. So I'm still working with him, even though we're, you know, we're no longer. This is, the, this is the big one, this is one of the last uh, artists, I think, his name is uh, Daniel Heyman, the guy that I met, the museum had a show called Art and War, so there were artists that were chosen that dealt with war. And Daniel did a series, uh, and they were actually portraits of the d detainees at Abu Ghraib. Uh, the lawyer that was uh, commissioned by the government to, to uh, defend these the detainees decided, it was in Philadelphia, and she decided that, well, you know, this is great, but it's gonna be, it's gonna be lawyer ease, and it's, you know, for the public to read. And she said, thought to herself, well, I need to have more than just Lawyeries. I want people to be able to see this, understand it. So she wanted to get a musician, an artist, a writer, and lawyers to come in and be part of this, uh, be part of this investigation. So uh, Daniel happened to be at a dinner party, and she was there, and she said, "Why don't you come do this?" So he said, "Yeah." And what's interesting about this is that they couldn't bring, they couldn't bring anything with them. So they, you know, that guy, that real famous one of the guys, got it sticking out like that. He looks, he's got covered with, uh, uh, looks like a. Ku Klux Klan guy, and they've got you know, electrodes stuck into his fingers. He interviewed him as well. And um, so it's that group of people. And um, so what he had to do was he took copper plates and a scribe, and he'd sit down and he would draw their portrait, and it's called dry point. So you, it's not a chemical thing, it's a direct way of drawing onto a plate. And then as they were talking, he would think, he'd hear fa phrases, and then he'd write them on the plate as well, but he had to do it backwards because it's prints backwards, right? So you get this really gestural, kind of funky look to them. And they're, they're wonderful prints. They're really, really amazing. Um, so he, uh, I asked him back to do a project <coughs> with uh, students. We had students who were basically, you know, who'd come from other countries. And uh, he wanted to do some of their portraits. And we had some, I thought, well, you know, Grand Forks, you know, it's 95% Norwegian and German. You know, how, what can we find here that's not that, you know? And so my wife, luckily, you know, has a lot of contacts in the community. She contacted the Women's Center, and uh, we got a hold of some students. There was a girl from Serbia, Croatia, who was um, uh, at the university on a, on a basketball scholarship. And she told this horrible story about growing up. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to go into it, but it's just this horrible story. I thought, wow, even Grand Forks has these immigrants who have these horrible stories. Uh, and so Daniel, it's very important for him to tell, he basically wants to give voice to people who don't have 
that opportunity is, is the way he looks at it. So when he, he was the second time he was there uh, doing this project with me, <coughs> I got to know him pretty well. We're good friends. I have a friend who's a graphic artist, and she uh, grew up on the Pine Ridge Reservations in South Dakota. And she said, "Have you ever thought about doing portraits of in, you know the Native in, Native Americans?" And he said, "Well, it'd be kind of fun. Come up with the money, we'll do it." So we wrote a grant, got a grant through the university, and we actually did it. It took over a year. So it's this, in our own words, Native Impressions, which is a it's a wonderful, wonderful part, uh, project. So what we did was we traveled to four of the reservations uh, in North Dakota. Um, Port Berthold, Standing Rock, um, uh, let's see, um, Turtle Mountain, and oh, I'm sorry, I'm going blank on the last one. Uh, but what we did was we contacted the, uh, the, the tribal leaders and the presidents of the co community colleges on, on the reservation said, this is a project we want to do. If you can choose, you choose three people that you think would be, have an interesting story to tell, this is what we're going to do. And it was really difficult because we had actually a social, uh, a social uh, somebody who had worked with, so, with social, I'm going blank on this now. She'd gone to the reservations to help, I guess, uh, do some things with social issues on, on the reservations and apparently really pissed them off. She did something really bad. So the president of the college called our university and said, I don't, we don't want any more people from your university coming here? We, you know, we're tired of this stuff. We're tired of whites coming in, and, and and I think what happened was she wrote a book, and published it. Didn't give the cre credit to anybody that she interviewed. Basically, took all the money herself. None, none of the money went back to the reservation, and that's just not okay. So, we had to convince uh, our president. We had to convince our dean. And we had to convince each reservation that we had no, no intentions like that. <clears throat> it was pretty difficult, but what was lu luckily, you know, uh, Lucy Gaji, you'll see her in a minute, uh, is from a reservation. She's white, but she's, her, her daughters are native, um, knows, knows the culture. Uh, we had a guy, Lee Janot, he'll be in here as well, who was sort of our contact person. He was the head of the Indian uh, student, American Indian Student Center on campus, and he knows everybody, and he was sort of our go-to guy. So he would contact people and sort of smooth the way and it was really great. So these are, this is what we ended up doing as portraits. So you see on the right here, um, the portrait itself, and there's some text on there. And on the left is the text about, from the interview. So what we did was we'd go on campus, or go to, we'd set up a place to meet. The person would come, we'd interview, interview them for about two hours. And Lucy would write down all the, we recorded them as well. And the understanding was after the recording, we'd give them back the tape. So they knew that what we weren't, doing anything with it afterwards. And uh, she would take that tape and go through it and get all the more important things that were said and use those in the text on the left-hand side. And she limited it to a thousand words. Uh, and Daniel on the right would do the drawing. And again, when, when, words would, when phrases would come out to him, he'd put them on the image itself. Uh, these are the blocks. So I prepared the blocks. And they're basically, uh, it's like half-inch plywood uh, with a smooth side up. And I painted it with, with uh, gesso. And then this is how Daniel did it. He would, do, he would sit down, he would draw their portrait like this, do sketches and write things down on the left-hand side. Here's an example of that. And then here's Lucy and Daniel working together. She, on the left here, she's taking notes and he's doing the portrait. And then he would uh, get onto the block and he'd start painting with, using ink. And he would do their portrait while it's sitting there. Now, again, I, the, part of this was I, that we did not, we agreed not to show them uh, so that was, you know, so you see, you don't see them, but you see him drawing, drawing there. So this is somebody here. And interestingly enough, one of the people that we interviewed actually grew up here and picked strawberries. And her father went to Shamawa School in the 40s, and it's, he tells a real horrible story about that, which I think is kind of, kind of fascinating. So this is somebody from, uh, I think this is a, uh, this is actually a brother of a student of mine. I didn't know that until afterwards. Uh, but this is from Port Berthold. So that's sort of the finished work before we started cutting it. There's another one. This case is fascinating. Um, he, his name is uh, Lee, and he, uh, his job is working for the government. And whenever farmers dig up remains, his job is to come and see if they're native or not. And then if they are, then he does a, he does a ceremony. 
And it's fascinating stories that he had, real, really interesting. He's a, he's a Vietnam vet. So here's some of the, the things we did. Now, when, you, when you went to each campus, <clears throat> uh, community college campus, uh, they would give us a room to stay and to work. And so this is uh, one of the studios that we're working in. This, so we had one, two, three, four. We had a crazy idea of actually doing the prints there, and it, that didn't work. There's just not enough time. So we do these in about two weeks. We go to each reservation for about two weeks. We did two or three trips doing that. Here's Daniel cutting, uh, cutting them away. There's Daniel left. There's one of his students from RISD. He teaches at RISD, and she came out as well, so she's cutting. That's all of us at Pine Ridge. Uh, Lucy's the one with the hat, and this is actually her folks place. They, she, she grew up, uh, they had a, a newspaper for the reservation. So she grew up working with, with type and letterpress, things like that. <coughs> Over the years, it became a little uh, restaurant, and that was kind of abandoned, so we got to use, work there for a while. So those are her kids, and on the left is her former husband. It's one of my students working on the press, printing. Uh, fracking. I just thought, you know, we're driving through the neighborhood, so we thought we'd show you a little bit of fracking there. And taking a break. It was hot. Uh, it was at uh, Fort Berthold, south of Fort Berthold. There was a powwow going on. And this particular spot has been used uh, for powwows, they said, for over, over 200 years, which I thought was really interesting. So it was a lot of fun. Um, very educational, because it's not your commercial type powwow. And it was big. So yeah, there's a little kid. There's Lucy and, and uh, getting soda pop. And they do run free. So that's Lee Janot on the right. And what we did was, uh, for fun, when we're done, we decided to do a portrait of him. And this, actually this one right here. And that's actually three by four feet. It's a huge, 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 huge portrait. Uh, so Lee's over here just taking a look at what we're doing. And we're inking it up. This shows we did we cut away, and now we're inking just certain parts of it. This is called a reductive, or what they call suicide print, meaning you can't go back. So it's you print one color, cut away, print another color on top of that, cut away, print another, cut away, until you have down to just about nothing. So you normally print light to dark, so like yellow, green, blue, purple, black, something like that. It's my wife doing a dabbing, this particular one, we had to dab sections of the face. Very time consuming, um, but it turned out really, really beautiful. Uh, we, we were really rushed. There was actually a, a university in New York that wanted to have this show. We scheduled it and we weren't done yet. So uh, Daniel was teaching a summer class in Provincetown uh, on the Cape. So we, my wife and I went out and finished up printing there, which was really, really fun. I think this is the video here. It just shows, I just wanted to show you a little bit about, it just takes a minute. Excuse the music, it's, uh, but. So we're just pulling the last, the last uh, color on this one particular portrait. So that's just sort of uh, what we did. Um, interesting thing about this is when we did this, it was uh, Lucy and Daniel and myself. Uh, and this is sort of the, the plight of the printmaker. Uh, when there's shows of this, Lucy and Daniel are part of this. My name is not included. They've been asked to come give lectures. I'm not there. Uh, I printed all these. I made all these. But I get, don't get the credit. And that's just the nature of the job. You know, it's not my art. I was printing for Daniel. And the, the text I was printing for Lucy did all that stuff, uh, which is kind of, you know, <laughs> a little bit. Uh, so there's, there's a whole bunch of proofs in the background. You can see we printed the first color very light, and it goes on top of that. There we are. I think this is where we're in Provincetown here, just sort of looking things over. You can see how he, he's playing with the color. He starts with the yellow. And then nah, I like the yellow. It goes to the, the red. I like the red. Now, his color sense and mine are not the same. And that's where you know, this kind of collaboration thing could come in. I, I fought with him a few times. There was some times where he, he loves very, very light text. And I, I brought the portfolio, if you want to look through it. 
And some of it's so light you can't read it. And I, and I would argue with him. I said, you know, it's fine, you know, but it's got to be a little, you know, he's, well, no, no, the words have to disappear. They have to be hard to read. I, I want to make it, you know, it has to be an effort to read this. I said, yeah, but if you can't read it, I mean, it's too light. So we'd have those kind of discussions. Um, so here's some, here's some that are about halfway done. And here's the whole set. Um, some are done, some are not. And here's the ones that are completed. So as we printed them out, we just laid them out, let them dry kind of thing. So we're talking about color there. There I am, inking it up. There's Lucy, this, just to show you what she does. She'd lay this type, and I mean it would take tens and tens of hours to lay the type. And then we had to pull a proof to see if it was right. Sometimes the spelling is wrong because you're doing this backwards. And it would, it would take forever. And that's why we're, so, we're running so late when we did the, this project. And here we got, you know, there's Lucy down below. And then there's, I think, one of my, a couple of my students. I think maybe it's my wife on the right there. All setting type. There she's inking it up. Just before we pulled the proof. There's a proof. So we just printed this on newsprint just to make sure that everything was right. It was, everything was proper. The spelling was proper. And you can see how she did this. It's all different angles and different things. And it just makes it a little harder to read. It's really meant to, when you look at this, it's really meant to take time to look at it. There's some more. There's one that's uh, almost got the last color. There's the last color. There's the plate or the, the, the woodcut. It's in reverse. There's the last one. And I just I did this one because I, the colors on the top there are the color schemes that we used. And what uh, Daniel would do is a lot of times he would come out to Grand Forks and work with me on this, but there's times when he couldn't do it. Uh, and he would send me the, the colors and I would mix them for him. And then I'd, you know, and he trusted my colors. I mean, he, I, I know how to mix colors, so I could mix them. You know, he'd just give me a sample and I could match it and we'd print it. And for the most part, it worked out really well. There's another uh, plate or another um, woodcut done. This is where our students thought of us. So there's Daniel left. I just witness, I just want to tell the truth. And I, there I am drinking. And then here's the students on the right, working away. <laughs> that, that was their perspective. I, I beg to differ. <laughs> and this was uh, this, his uh, gallery. This is what they, they uh, basically did as, once, it, once it became. Now what shocked me about this is that we've done these prints for artists. And we had it, the, the box made, it's a beautiful set. I thought, well, you know, uh, you know, artists, well, it's probably a couple thousand dollars. Maybe that's what, it, what the set would be. Um, when we sent it to the, his agent, she said, no, it's 25,000. I about fell on my chair. So now they're up to about $35,000 for the set. And oddly enough, it's selling. Yale bought one, a uh, museum in Virginia bought one. In Texas, about a year ago, now that they bought one, it's selling. Uh, it's printed out, but this was sort of my genius idea. When we had, actually did the printing, I thought it wouldn't be interesting to do handmade paper that's paper is indigenous to the Dakotas, indigenous to where they're from, which we did. So, you know, it was it's a real fun it's a real fun project, and that's kind of it. Um, so a lot of these things, that, you know, my work doesn't really I don't I didn't I'm not printing like them, but uh, for me it's. Uh, What's inspired me is working with people who have this sort of dedication to, to uh, society, I guess, and to, you know, to social justice. And so I always chose artists who had that in some, to some degree. Uh, and it was always really fun. And, and I've always found that most artists are really, really nice people. They're not jerks. There are some around, but just avoid those guys. You know. um, that's kind of it. I do want to, I mean, I would like to, if, if, if it's possible, I do have some samples of like Peter's work and this portfolio. I would like to sort of lay them out if you're interested in looking at them. I'd love to do that. Okay, great. Hi there. Uh, my name's Casey. I Hi. don't know a thing one about the printmaking process. Uh, yeah. And I would assume that when you have these plates that you've drawn on or etched on or whatever method you do, and you're doing color work, that you make one color sheet, uh, one color, and then uh, you have to clean the whole thing off yes. and put another color on. Yes. Okay, at least I got that far. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So 
there must be some method of making sure that every time you put a new color on, it's in the same place. Yes. That's How the do you hard do part. That? <clears throat> That's oh, the okay. hard part. Yeah, it's, it's a registration. And uh, it's difficult. And there's different ways of doing it. What we did with this one is what's called uh, T-bar. So on the back of each sheet, I would put basically measure halfway and put little marks on the each, and then one would make a T. So there's a T and a bar. The T would identify the top part of the plate or the, of the image. So I knew if I was doing this, you know, because you're doing 50 of these things, you know, you, sometimes you get turned around, you don't, you start printing them upside down or something. You don't want to do that. <clears throat> and uh, so there's that one. And, and with this one, what was interesting is now this we did two sets. One was with the handmade paper. And then there's another one on Okawara paper, which is what this one is. It's a, it's a cheaper paper. The idea was we were going to do, I think we were going to do 10 of the, of the handmade paper and uh, 50, uh, 15, I think, no, no, 10 of, 10 of the, yeah, 10 of the handmade paper and 15 of the Okawara. And we, <clears throat> I screwed one of them up. And so we actually have an addition of nine of the handmade paper and 11 of the uh, Okawara. And so, um, and those were both done with the T-bar registration. But I guess what I'm getting at is the handmade paper, it has decals. It's all, they're different in every one. So the registration is really hard to do. So what I would do is take a, a razor and just about an eighth of an inch in the middle, I'd shave that off so there's a straight edge there. So when I could register that, I would know exactly where that goes. And there's a, a corresponding registration mark on the woodcut itself, so you know it fits there. And some of them are off a little bit. Uh, but, you know, if you look at his style of imagery, it's very expressive. It's not very realistic. And I was really surprised when he did these portraits because uh, these are, you know, people, normal people who, who uh, you know, they don't know. And they're, you know, I, I was expecting to say, well, you know, this doesn't look like me. But most people thought it was great. They go, oh, yeah, that's kind of get the essence of me. And that's kind of neat. Yes. So before we run out of time, are you going right. to lay your work out? Yes. Well, we better hurry. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>